Praise the Lord, everybody. You can make your way back to your seats. of the Lord today, and we can feel the presence of God. Amen. The church is open during construction. Praise God. Amen. We're excited about what God's doing, and uh, undoubtedly you were able to see the, the progress on the remodel, and we apologize for last week. You couldn't use the restrooms on this side of the building. That was not by design. We got in, started to move stuff around, and things started falling apart. And so we knew something had to be done, praise God. And so uh, this week they are, they are still being built. They're usable. And by next week, uh, in the name of the Lord, hopefully in Jesus' name, uh, they will be ready to go fully finished. So we're excited about that. A lot of work has been done uh, to the building, and more work is yet to be done. And we're thankful for that because God's building his church. Amen. God's moving the kingdom forward. We're thankful in the name of Jesus today. So good to have all of our visitors and guests with us this morning. A number of folks that uh, aren't normally with us. We're glad that you're here. I see Brother Mark's mother's here today. Is that right? Amen. Met her last night. God bless you. Amen. I heard her husband pastor in the city of Hollister, is that correct? Hollister, California. Well, we're honored that you're here with us today, sister. God bless you today. And uh, so good to have one of my dearest friends uh, in the world here, Brother Kevin Daniel on the keyboard. Amen. Brother, does that microphone work over there for him? Can he talk from there? I want him to greet the church in Jesus' name. That microphone does work, I think. I want him to greet the church and uh, such an anointed man of God, dear friend. Uh, my wife and I, and uh, so appreciate his anointing. You could feel the anointing this morning and the presence of God that was here. And uh, that mic works. Why don't you greet the congregation in Jesus' name? Praise the Lord. So good to be here with y'all in the house. Amen. 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 We're here now, we're here now, you know, through this process, but it's like we're believing God, believing God, and it's just so incredible to see the um, fulfillment of that promise, amen? Yeah, amen. And um, to be a part of it and to see it, and, and more than that, just to feel, and I mentioned it yesterday, just you can just feel that um, uh, this, your seats aren't going to be this roomy for That's much right. longer, That's and right. um, that there's going to be a harvest of souls that God has promised us to come into this place, so... Um, I'm excited about what God's doing. I'm excited to be able to um, be a part of it in a small way anytime I get to come by. And um, just, I can't wait to hear the testimonies. God bless. Amen. Thank you. God bless. Praise the Lord. Let's go ahead and stand this morning, if you would. We are honored today to have Bishop uh, Hodges with us today. He's District Superintendent of the Southern California District We're of the United Pentecostal Church. Our, our church is a part of the United Pentecostal Church in Southern California. And um, we are honored to have him with us. He's a man of God, a man that, uh, of prayer, of leadership. He's led uh, not just our district, but truly our, our movement uh, during uh, the last few years, especially uh, leading the fight for religious liberty uh, here in California. As you know, that is a fight, and he's been on the front lines of that. And I, I appreciate more than all of that, uh, he has just a kind spirit. I was telling my wife, you can, you can feel the, the spirit of a man when you meet him and get to know them and just kind of be around them. And he's got a Christian spirit, a great spirit. I'm just so blessed that he's going to minister to the church today. He ministered to our leaders yesterday. Great word for all of our folks that are leading here, volunteering, and a number of you are there today. And uh, I just want him to come, take his liberty. Brother Hodges, we're glad that you're here. Honored. Welcome to come. Thank you, Pastor Johnson. Thank you, everyone. Now, before I go further, I'd like you to join me in giving Jesus Christ the loudest hand clap you've given anybody all week long.
Doesn't it feel good to do that? It feels really good to do that. The reason it feels so good to do that is because that's what we were created to do. To bring glory, praise, honor, adulation to our King of Kings, our Lord of Lords, our Creator. Amen. I am very blessed to drive a wonderful car. I think it is. It's a Tesla car. Actually, it more drives me than I drive it. But anyway, that's a wonderful car. But if I were to decide today after church, you know what? I'm going to go take a break. I'm driving to Hawaii. Let's go to Hawaii. I won't get very far. I might get a little past the breakers maybe. But that car was not designed to go in the ocean. And that wonderful car would lose its value very quickly. It would break down. It would be pretty much worthless. Isn't that amazing? That's the way it is with our lives. When we spend our lives in the way they were designed by the heavenly designer, the creator, God of all that created us, it's a wonderful thing. But when we try to use our lives for something the designer never intended, it's going to break down, lose value, may become worthless. But today we're doing what he designed us to do. We're in the house of the Lord. We're praising the Lord. We're magnifying the Lord. Oh, praise ye the Lord, all ye people. Make a joyful noise. Under the Lord, all you saints. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Lord. Amen, amen, amen. It's our delight, it's our honor, our privilege to be here. We so enjoyed uh, yesterday the leadership uh, meeting that we had, meeting with your leaders. And what a wonderful time we had there. And it's great to have Brother Kevin Daniel with us today, who is the son-in-law of one of my very good friends, Brother Dave Henry back in Georgia, and, uh, and good to be with all of you. This church history goes way, 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 way back, and I just a, about a month ago was in North Carolina briefly and had lunch with your former, former pastor, Brother Ewell Watts, and his son, Brent Watts, and their wives, and uh, they still have wonderful, fond memories, the Pasadena Church. We saw your former pastor just last month at our general conference, and now we're glad to be here with your current pastor, I think the one the Lord's given you until he returns. How many appreciate Brother and Sister Micah Johnson? Thank Thank God for sending us our pastor. I love it. And what a miracle this building is and this property. Now, your pastor sent me pictures periodically through that process, but honestly, those pictures did not do it justice. In fact, honestly, when I looked at those pictures, especially the overhead aerial pictures, I thought, oh my goodness, that's a project right there that they are. They are. I didn't say that, but that's what I thought. That's a project that they're taking on. But when I drove up the road yesterday for the first time and saw this from the street view, I thought, is this the same place? Am I at the right address? It looks so beautiful from the street, and you're even beautifying it more in the interior. It's a construction zone out here, in case you don't know. Now, if you're a visitor and guest today, so am I. So it's my first time here. But if I lived in this area, this would be my church home. Because I know this pastor. I know this church. This would be my church home. Everyone needs a good oneness apostolic Pentecostal Bible church. Amen. And if you have one, be faithful to it. But if you don't have one, maybe the Lord brought you here to make this your your church home. Amen. And finally, my son-in-law and daughter send their greetings. They spent time here, some years here, as the assistant associate pastor in Pasadena Church under Pastor Brown, Amato, and Amber Huizar. They send you their love. And so many of you have expressed to me already how much they, they meant to you. I appreciate that. And we'll share that with them. Well, I'm glad to bring you the Word of God. The Lord's given me a message, I believe, just for such a time as this. How many of you love God's Word? Hallelujah. I love, I love God's Word. In fact, the scripture of the day popped up on my phone, one of the apps, you know, that we use. And, um, and, and, and the scripture just popped up this morning. And, and it said that we'll prosper if we meditate day and night 
in the Word of God. I'm sure that's from Joshua 1.8. I didn't open it up to look at the whole reference, but uh, I know that Joshua 1.8 says that. It says you'll prosper if you meditate to do according to all that's written in God's Word. The Word of God is powerful. I turn your attention this morning to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 6. I like to read three verses. Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in Ephesians chapter 4, and verse number 6. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Everyone say gift. Everybody say grace. Well, that's a pretty good gift right there, isn't it? The gift of grace. Amen. Verse 8. Wherefore he saith, when Jesus ascended up on high, he did two things. Number one, he led captivity captive. And number two, he gave gifts unto men. What does it mean that he led captivity captive? What that means is what once held you captive has now been conquered. You have nothing more to fear. The things that once held us captive are now held captive themselves. We have overcome. We have conquered. Amen. And number two, he gave gifts unto men. That's what I'm focusing on today in this message. The gifts that were given unto men upon the ascension of Jesus Christ. James said, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. You know, the very best gifts in life come from God. We're entering into a season now. Right now we're in Thanksgiving, and then we go into Christmas where people exchange gifts. But every best gift comes from God. How many know that's true? The best gifts always come from God. Today's message I would entitle this, the three best ascension gifts. The three best ascension gifts. Lord, I thank you for this beautiful audience. I thank you for the beautiful building and property you've recently given them, the miracle of this wonderful, wonderful gift. Now, Lord, I pray that you would give us ears to hear what your spirit is saying to the church. Let there be no distraction from your word. Let no words be stolen. Let no words be lost. Let every word accomplish the purpose to which it is sent. And I pray, God, today that we would not be hearers only, but that we would be doers of your word. Pray for the unction of the Holy Ghost that I might deliver your anointed word as you have placed it in my heart to share with this wonderful group of your people. We ask your blessings, your favor, in Jesus' name. And everyone said amen. 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 I feel a great spirit in this house. I feel a great spirit of God, and I great, feel a great spirit of fellowship of God's people. One more time, let's just rejoice in the Lord and give him thanks. We give you thanks, Lord. We give you honor. We give you praise. We magnify your name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen. You may be seated. God richly, richly bless you. Pray for my wife and pray for my family today. I'm in a stretch right now where I'm gone seven out of ten weeks from my home and home, home church. So uh, just say a little prayer for them. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. The three best... Ascension gifts. Now, I could ask you, well, I'll ask you, how many of you like gifts? And that's what usually happens. About half the hands go up. Does that mean that those that did not raise your hand, you don't want any gifts this upcoming season? Is that what that means? Is that what, how many like gifts? All right. It's okay to like gifts. All right. It's not a trick question. Everyone likes gifts. I love this legendary tale of two brothers who both became independently successful and quite wealthy. They had a sibling rivalry that started while they were young, and that was to see who could give their mom the very best gift at Christmas time. And now that they were successful, now that they had means, their gifts became quite exotic. And they had done this for so many years, they just about ran out of ideas as to what to buy next. 
So this particular year, one of the sons had a special relationship with an automobile producer, kind of like an Elon Musk. And he was able to convince his friend to sell him a prototype that was not yet in production, a -a one-of-a-kind automobile that had features beyond what anyone has ever seen in an automobile. Paid quite a sum of money to obtain that and gave that to his mom for Christmas. The other brother kind of thought of something novel. At great expense and even great peril of his own life, he took a safari to the deep jungles of the Amazon. He did it properly and legally. He got all the permissions from the government to capture one of the most rare exotic birds on planet Earth. And at great expense and very carefully brought that bird back to the United States, again legally paying every fee and process to go through, great effort, and presented that bird to his mother on Christmas. As was their custom, they waited for mom to respond, and as was her custom, sometimes she waited days to do so. But finally, when she responded, she said this, to my son, that presented me the most exotic car I've ever seen or known of, thank you, it's amazing. And to my other son, who presented me this amazing bird that I've never seen or heard of before, just want to let you know, it was delicious. What we have here is a classic example of misplaced values, which actually seems to be an epidemic in America right now. Far too many people spend money they don't have to buy things they certainly don't need to impress people that half the time they don't even like. Misplaced values. The Bible says in Matthew 7, 11, and you thought that was a corner, 20, corner 24-hour market. No. Started in the Bible. Matthew 7. This is heaven 7 You know, oh, thank heaven for 7 Well, here's where it is right here. Matthew 7 11. If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him? Our heavenly Father gives us many good gifts. David writes in Psalm 68, 19, Blessed be the Lord, who daily loadeth us with benefits, even the God of our salvation, the greatest benefit of all. Amen. (laughs) Praise God. The Bible tells us that the devil comes but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. But I'm telling you today, Jesus came to heal, to fill, and to employ. He gives life more abundantly. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So there are many gifts. We could not even enumerate all the gifts today that come from our Heavenly Father. But our scripture text tells us that upon the ascension of Jesus Christ back into heaven, he gave gifts unto men, many of them. Today I'm going to preach to you about what I believe are the three best ascension gifts. What are these? Number one, the first primary and best gift that we receive is the result of the ascension of Jesus Christ. It's called the gift of the Holy Ghost. That's number one. The gift of the Holy Ghost. Now, I read to you Matthew 7, 11. Let me read you Luke's rendering of that same promise. In Luke eleven thirteen. 13, If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him? Luke identifies that best gift that God gives to us the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost. Thirteen chapters later, that same Dr. Luke would record Jesus' last words on planet Earth just before he ascends back into heaven. 
Now, how many know last words are important? They are. If you knew this was your last day to live on earth, you would not waste your time talking about the weather. You would not waste your time talking about the stock market. You would not waste your time talking about sports. Now, all those things may be important in the normal scheme of life, but they're certainly not most important And that becomes very clear if you know it's your last day on earth. You're going to spend your time with the people that are most meaningful to you, and you're going to try to impart to them the most meaningful words you can. Your parting words will be words forever remembered. It makes them very important. Jesus knew this was the last time they would see him on earth for 2,000 years. Years. They've been waiting, watching for his return. We are still waiting, watching today, and it's about to happen, by the way. We're at the end of that 2,000 year period, so we are the generation that's going to see it. Amen. But the last words he left with them are recorded in Luke 24 and 49. He said this Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry or wait you in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. I love the word they use here, endued. He didn't just say to you, receive power, get some power. You are like endued. You are like infused with this power, amen, from on high. He led them out as far as Bethany, lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Amen. The same Dr. Luke, who's the ghostwriter here in Luke 24, writes in Acts 1. And it picks right up where he leaves off in Luke. He says, The former treaties have I made, O Theophilus, of all Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up, the ascension. After that he, through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs being seen 40 days, speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom of God, and being assembled with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, you've heard of me. For John the Baptist truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Verse 8, but you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you'll be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, under the entire earth. They're remembering the last recorded words of Jesus on earth before he ascends into heaven. When it writes in Acts 1-9, and when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up in a cloud, received him out of their sight, and while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, Two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you saw him go up into heaven. That's where we are today, waiting and looking for the return of Jesus in the clouds. Praise God. Verse 12 says they returned to Jerusalem and they began to wait. It names different ones that were waiting, including Mary, the mother of Jesus. They waited 10 days. Now remember, it's over 500 that sees him ascend into heaven. But 10 days later, the crowd has dwindled down. And it's about 120 that are still, after 10 days, waiting. Now, you know, give them a break. They had jobs and responsibilities. Mom had kids to, you know, clothe and feed and send off to school. and, and, And men had businesses and what have you. But 10 days later... About 120 are still waiting. And finally, it happens in Acts 2, verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come. That was on a Sunday, by the way. That's kind of why we traditionally gather on Sundays, because of this. They were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly, there came a sound from heaven. You'll find God answers suddenly. Not always quickly, but always suddenly. You may have to wait days, weeks, months, years, but when it happens, it will happen suddenly. 
and you'll find it's accompanied with a sound. If you walked in here today and it's your first time in this church or a church like this one, you might be thinking, oh my goodness, my watch is going off saying, Loud environment, loud environment. Mine goes off multiple times in Pentecostal service. I'm not sure you can be a Pentecostal church if your Apple Watch doesn't say you're in a loud environment. Amen. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. I have stood with Brother Billy Cole in front of a crowd in Ethiopia, 400,000 people. I know you've never heard that number because we never reported it. We agreed the numbers were too fantastical. We would just cut every count in half, and that's what we did. So we reported a crowd of 200,000 people. Still don't believe that, but that was half the actual count. I've stood there when 100,000 people were receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost at the same time for the first time. You talk about the sound of a rushing mighty wind. That is the sound of a rushing mighty wind. It filled all the house where they were sitting. It wasn't for one or two or a few. It was for everybody. There appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire set upon each of them. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost. All of them were filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Every time we gather in the church house, it doesn't matter whether it's Bible study Wednesday night or church on Sunday. It doesn't matter what I'm preaching, what I'm teaching, or whatever. The end goal is always the same, that everybody in the house will be filled with the Holy Ghost. Go home filled with the Holy Ghost. Praise God. Hallelujah. Now look at this, a crowd gather. Just like your crowd's going to gather in this church. You wait, it's going to happen. They're going to overflow this church house. I got a call about six months ago from one of our pastors, pastors in Escondido, California, and pastors of the church in Denver, Colorado. He's done that for years. He flies back and forth. He's at one 10 days and the other 10 days. He's also our SoCal District Spanish Ministries Coordinator. Following Brother uh, Ro Orozco's uh, death, uh, we're so still mourning that. But uh, but Brother Brother Larry Romero called me and he said, Brother, he, he sounded frantic. He, he said, Bishop Hodges, I got a problem. I got a problem. I need help. I need help. I need your help. And I'm thinking, my goodness, did he have a family member die? What's going on here? I said, what's the problem? He said, we've got too many people coming to our church. <laughs> that's what he was frantically needing help with. I said, well, that's a good problem. <laughs> that's a good problem. <clears throat> but it really is a problem. I've preached at his church. This is the church in Denver. And maybe that church seats maybe 200 people. Maybe you could cram and squeeze, you know, 250, 300 if there's like literally no space anywhere in the aisles or anything. He's having over 500 people show up at his church, strangers from all over. They're just coming. I said, Brother Romero, what, what, what caused this? He said, I don't know. I said, what do you, did you do? to? He said, nothing. I said, what have you done differently recently? Nothing. We're just doing what we've always done. They're just showing up. Amen. He called me back a few Sundays later. He said, it took us today one hour and a half to baptize the people that wanted to be baptized. Three weeks ago, he texted, said, you'll never believe it. We just passed the 300 mark of people baptized in Jesus' name since it started about six months. 300 people baptized in Jesus' name. And there's no explanation for it. He said they're coming from everywhere, different countries everywhere. He said they know nothing about God or the Bible. They know nothing about Pentecost. They know nothing about holiness or nothing. And like, like man, we're, I, I don't even know what to do with this. I said, well, where are you putting them? Because I know their church. He says, anywhere we can. They're in all the different floors, different rooms. We're trying to pipe in live feeds. We're, we don't know what to do with it. Amazing. What a good problem, right? God is just sending these people. And I'm remembering this story. Jesus said himself, he said, that, he said as in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. Now, usually when we quote that, we're thinking of all the negative stuff and all the evil stuff that's happening in the world. And that certainly is true. 
But let me tell you something. There's a positive side to that story because not everybody died in the flood. Oh, no. Oh, no. Noah and his family were saved. The righteous ones were saved. And also, there were animals that came into that ark. Noah didn't go on a safari. God sent them to the ark. Hallelujah. That's what's happening in Denver. It's the cloud the size of a man's hand, but it pretends an outpouring of the end times, the rain of the Holy Ghost, and an end gathering of a harvest like we've never known before. And it's going to happen right here, Pastor. It's going to happen right here, Covina. It's going to happen right here, New Life. You won't be able to handle the people. They'll outnumber you. (laughs) That's a good problem. That's a good problem. You mark my words, it's happening. It happened on the day of Pentecost. People just came from everywhere. Little room crowded with 120 people, and before they know it, they got 3,000 and more showing up. We know that because the same day, 3,000 were baptized and filled with the Spirit. There had to be more than 3,000. Thousands showed up. And when the crowd gathered, they asked this question, what meaneth this? Oh, let me tell you something. We're doing something right. When people walk in here and they go, what is going on? What is happening here? What does this all mean? And their eyes are big as sausage. I remember a few years ago, I was doing the I was the executive rep for UPCI doing the conference in New York Metro, and we stayed over the weekend and preached for Brother Dawson. Uh, If you ever get to go to his church, I think it's in Queens, I think, um, right by one of the subway stations there. But it's a church in the round. It's the most unique experience when you're preaching. You got people all the way behind you. The balcony all the way around, and it's crammed, packed full with people. We sit on the front row, but it's not that far from the altar. It's about like three feet from the altar. And, and kids and people get to worship. They do in victory mark. They're stepping on your toes. And uh, that particular conference, I had a doctor, uh, two doctors actually. They're married, two different practices, uh, very, very, uh, very famous doctors. In fact, she's the one that treated President Trump during COVID. And uh, they're personal friends of mine. And they wanted to come hear me preach. And they said, where are you preaching next? I said, New York. They said, we'll fly there. And they did. Spent the weekend. They're sitting on the front row. Their eyes got as big as saucers. They had never seen anything like that in their life. (laughs) Amen. What meaneth this? What is going on? But when I dropped them off at the airport, I started pulling away. And Wayne, the husband, he, he, he said, wait, wait, wait. And I thought they had left something in the car. And I stopped and backed up. And he came, and, and I get out, and I said, what, what, would you leave? And he said, no, no, no. He had tears running down his face. These, these folks are like, they're probably like in their 70s. And uh, he came and gave me a bear hug. He said, I just want to thank you for this weekend. He said, I thought I knew what the Bible meant when it said, in the last days, true worshipers will worship in spirit and truth. He said, I didn't have a clue as to what that meant until this weekend. Hallelujah. We're Pentecostal. What meaneth this? We need more Holy Ghost Church where people say, What meaneth this? Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Well, Peter the Apostle, that was his opening. He stood up to tell him, What meaneth this? And he preaches the first gospel message in the history of the world, the gospel of Jesus Christ message. You know, some people are confused. They think the gospel is in the gospels. No, it's not preached in the gospels. It can't be. The gospels are the gospel. It's the story of Christ's miraculous birth, his life, his ministry, his miracles, his his death, his burial, his resurrection, and then finally his ascension. That is the gospel of the redemption that Jesus brings But it wasn't preached in the Gospels because it hadn't happened yet. And so it's first preached in the next book after the Gospels, the book of Acts. Chapter 2 is a recording of the first Gospel of Jesus Christ sermon being preached. You can read the original sermon for yourself. Peter, standing with all the apostles, is their spokesman, preaches the Gospel. He answers the question, what 
meaneth this. And as the result of the preaching of the gospel that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, that Jesus Christ is the creator who entered his own creation. That Jesus Christ is our savior and our Jehovah, praise God. He's our alpha, he's our omega. He's the beginning, he's the end. He's the Jehovah of the Old Testament, the Jesus of the new, amen. He preaches that sermon. <coughs> After hearing that sermon, their question changes. Let me get a drink of water. Their question changes from what meaneth this to what shall we do? I love that. Every preaching, every teaching should conclude with the what shall we do. You come in with a question. What does this mean? The preaching, the teaching of God's word will explain it to you. Amen. Jeremiah 3.15, God said, I will give you pastors after my heart who will feed you with knowledge and understanding. What shall we do? We're going to tell you what you shall do. And the answer is my personal favorite verse in the whole Bible, if you're allowed to have a favorite verse. It's verse 38 of Acts chapter 2. And the reason it's my most favorite verse is because it's the answer to the first question, to the first gospel of Jesus Christ's sermon, what shall I do? And Peter said, repent and be baptized. Every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That's what we shall do with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. I love that so much. My Starbucks name is Acts 2.38. It really is. I love it. I'm in airports all the time, and, and I'll purposely just wait, you know, until they call the name on the drink. Acts 2.38, your drink is ready. I got ungodly, wicked Starbucks preaching the gospel. How During COVID, when our church was so much in the news, we have an electronic sign in front of our church, and we're on a main, main road right off the freeway, two city, two city blocks from City Hall. And uh, I said, you know what? We're in the news, every news all around the world, and it killed every message on that sign. I just want two messages on that sign. Acts 2.38, I, and, and, and this is the safest place on earth. And today, that's still the only two messages. We've just left those only two messages on our sign. I love the fact that I got PBS and CNN and, and NBC and ABC and, and, and all of these, uh, I, and, they're, and they're, they're doing interviews, and right behind them is flashing Acts 2.38, Acts 2.38, Acts 2.38. Oh, I love that so much. They're preaching the gospel for us, hallelujah, around the world. Amen. Let the ungodly... That's the message, people. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. So that is the answer. The number one greatest gift of the ascension of Jesus Christ is the gift of the Holy Ghost. Number two, number two is the gift of the church. The church. Notice I didn't say a church. I said the church. Jesus called it my church. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm talking about the church that was birthed as the result of Acts 2. Birthed because of the new births of more than 3,000 on that first day. Born again. Born again. A church that's apostolic in doctrine. A church that is Pentecostal in experience. A church that is holiness in lifestyle. And a church that is evangelistic in mission. Hallelujah. And Ephesians 2, 20 says we're built on the foundation of of that church, the apostles, prophets, and Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone in whom the whole building of the church fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple to our God. Hallelujah. That's us, the church, the true church, the true church. Now, let me tell you something. I remember during that, during that course, by the way, if you're not aware, when they closed churches, California was the most egregious of every state. And, and finally, on May 8th, our California governor, Gavin Newsom, had a press conference. And in that press conference, he said, by this time next week, California, 70% of California, 70% will be reopened for business as normal. But he left churches completely out of the equation. A reporter asked the question, what about churches? He said, there, there's, no, there's no date that churches that we can give you that they'll open. He said, but whenever that does happen, I can tell you one thing, they will never go back to normal. That's what he said in the press conference. You can go listen to it for yourself. When he said that, we filed a federal lawsuit. Now, there's a long story how that came about, and the backstory that we don't even tell the public or the press is that we were actually working 
uh, hand in glove with the Department of Justice at the time. Eric Dryband, Department of uh, head of uh, uh, civil rights under uh, William Barr, under the President Trump administration. We we're working in Washington D.C. in the Department of Justice, but uh, that's kind of some of the backstory on that. So we filed laws, and the Dar Department of Justice is the one that told us the date to file. We've been preparing the suits, just waiting on you know, when to file. And I was hoping we wouldn't have to do it. I personally reached out to Governor Newsom, uh, personally uh, got a letter to him. I don't know him personally. We're not personal friends, but we have a mutual personal friend. And so our mutual personal friend met with him, brought him our letters, our recommendations. And, and the response we got back is, we don't know what to do with churches. We, we know business and industry. We, we got all that down. We have no idea what to do with churches. We said, well, we'll help you with churches. And so we got together with a group of religious leaders in California representing about 10,000 churches and brought them protocols. I actually brought them the protocols from the NACLC, our own UPCI uh, arm of this, and said, here's protocols for safely reopening churches. We've got medical experts that have, you know, written these protocols. We've got scientists that have written these protocols, CDC uh, leaders, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, we thought we were working with them. Turns out they were just, were, it just, they were just sort of patronizing us, really. Um, so the Department of Justice said file on on May 8, and, and we filed on May 8. We were in court. You'll all remember the year 2020 as the year of COVID. I remember it as the year of court. We had 11 rulings in less than one year. That's some kind of record they tell me at the federal level. We had four federal district court rulings. We had, we had four Ninth Circuit court rulings. We had three U.S. Supreme Court rulings, which they say has never been the case on any case in history of America. That one single case would get three not only hearings, but rulings at the Supreme Court level. And the first nine were all against our position of reopening churches. And our, re our religious liberties are supposed to be <laughs> guaranteed in the U.S. Constitution. But because of a quote-unquote exigentic emergency, they were abrogating our constitutional guarantees. They just swept that aside. And they said that does not apply in these circumstances. That's how serious this matter was. And so that's what we were fighting for. And uh, so I, I remember one time a reporter came out of court again, and they shoved the microphone in my face. They said, well, how does it feel to lose again in federal court? And, and I said, you know, I, that's an interesting question. I never really thought of it that way. I said, you know, to me, this is not a game, and it's not a sport like where you keep score. Okay, how many wins you got? How many losses? No, this is a matter of what's right and what's wrong. And, and we're standing for what's right. I, I'm praying the court can get it right. But if they don't, that doesn't make our position wrong. We're standing for what's right and wrong, and I'm hoping because it's American, because there is a Constitution, even though it's not being followed right now, I'm hoping in the end that we will, we will win, and of course we did win in the end. The final two rulings from the Supreme Court, January 5, 2021, April 26, 2021, were resounding victories. In fact, we received a 6-3 to three majority Supreme Court ruling in the end. That's a miracle these days. So going forward, government can no longer ever shut churches arbitrarily. And if there ever is an emergency requiring everyone to close their doors and stay home, then that means everyone. And if anyone is allowed to be open for any reason, churches have to be in that number. So churches will be the last to close and the first to reopen. Amen. The facts are... When everybody else was closed, liquor stores never did. Marijuana dispensaries never did. Abortion clinics never did. Planned Parenthood hung banners on their, on their, in front of their business during COVID shutdown, said, these doors stay open, and they never forced them to close. How ironic is that? When there were seven times more dying every day at that abortion clinic than were dying of COVID. How ironic is that? When the church is the only place. Now, we need to protect life. One of my daughters is a nurse. She worked the COVID ward. We get that. We understand that. We're behind. I got up at my home church today. There's a medical doctor that's preaching today. He's our evangelist. He's a medical doctor. We understand that. We appreciate medicine. We, we appreciate people's safety, health, welfare. We, we get that. But listen. Church is the only place that's going to be concerned about your eternal life, not just your earthly life. Yeah. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Praise God. So we put on the sign, safest place on earth. But we started thinking about this, and we get this question, of course. We're getting the question from within the church, not just from the press. I remember one, one I think I was on national news, one of the national networks on a national broadcast, and the, and the reporter said, or the anchor said, um, do, 
do you and Gavin Newsom go way back? Like, does he have something personal against you? Or are you guys like, I said, no, I, I've never met Gavin Newsom. But, but they were wondering, why is he being so onerous, you know, about, about churches? And it made me thinking, yeah, wh- why is he? What is going on here, really, you know? When you're opening everything else, but still not opening churches, even if we're willing to follow every protocol, no, you can't open your church. And, and they were, th- you know what we were threatened with? Each member that attended threatened with a $1,000 fine for each time they attend church. And the pastor threatened with arrest and put in jail. That's what we were threatened with, literal letters of threats received to that, to that effect. That's the threats they were, they were putting in front of us. And uh, so I got to thinking about that. Why is there this huge animus that becomes very apparent in a situation like this against churches? And it came to me why. It came to me why. The reason why is this. Paul writes it. He said, the spirit of Antichrist is already at work in the world today. That's 2,000 years ago. The authors of the Bible say, in the end times, the devil's activity will increase because he knows he has but a short time to work. We're in those end times. We're facing the spirit of Antichrist like no one's ever faced it before in earth, right? And the only thing standing between the Antichrist and his goal of ruling this world is the church. It's the only institution he cannot control. Hallelujah. Amen. So this one reporter said, how do you have so much courage? You know, you're losing eight, nine times in court, and 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 how do you have a, how do you smile? How do you have courage? How do you, I said, it's really easy. I said, here's what you all don't understand. I said, this lawsuit's not about me. It's not about Bishop Art Hodge. It's not about even the church I pastor, South Bay Pentecostal Church. That's not really what it's about. I said, what it's about is the spirit of Antichrist is coming against Christ. And Christ is the one that established the church. And here's what he said in Matthew 16, 18. In fact, the first time the word church is ever used in history, Jesus coined it in Matthew 16, 18. He said, I'm going to build my church. I'm going to do something new. And the very gates of hell, the Antichrist, Satan, shall not prevail against this church. That's this church. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. So I told this reporter, I said, it's not about me. It's not about my church. It's about Christ's church, and that church is invincible. That's why I can smile. That's why I'm not worried. That's why I'm not stressed or pressured. Yeah, it's not about me. It's not my fight. I'm just the representative for him. Praise God. Amen. It's about his church. Now listen, when Jesus used that word in Matthew 16 18, think about it. The audience he's speaking to were Jews at the time. They knew what the tabernacle was. That was the first building, if you will, that God designated, I'll meet you there. That tabernacle burnt with fire at Shiloh. I stood there two years ago, right at that very spot. Never to be rebuilt again. They knew about the temple But the temple was destroyed twice, and today it's not yet been restored and rebuilt. They knew about the synagogues, but if you go tour Israel, well, you get a really bargain if you go do it this week. But, but, uh, you know, wait till things settle there. And if you go back on a tour to Israel, uh, you can visit all those synagogue sites. And not one of them was left standing. They're all in ruins. They knew that. But Jesus said, I'm going to do something different. The word comes from a Greek word, ecclesia, which means called out once. And it had been used in a secular manner, but never had it been used in this manner of describing the meeting place of God and man. Jesus coined that and called it church. He said, I'm going to call people out from the tabernacle. I'm going to call them out from the temple. I'm going to call them out from the synagogues. By the way, I'm going to call beyond the Jews. I'm going to call them every nation, every language group, every cultures group, every, every tribe on earth. I'm going to bring them into one new thing called the church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know why Satan hates the church? It's the only thing standing between him and ruling the world. He hates the church because we are plundering hell to populate heaven. Don't be afraid of hell. Don't be afraid of Satan. Don't be afraid of the devil. Don't be afraid of the evil. Praise God. He's afraid of us. He's afraid of us. Get off the defense. Go on the offense. The gates of hell cannot withstand the assault of the church. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
Hallelujah. Well, our missionaries would drive across the bridge to San Francisco. That's kind of like the belly of the beast, right? He would drive across the bridge every day to San Francisco. And every time he'd cross that bridge, he'd pray, God, I'm coming into the city. Bind the strong men of the city. He'd pray that every day. And God rebuked him said, don't ever pray that prayer again. He said, when you come into the city, you are the strong man of the city. Praise God. We are the strong man. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Hallelujah. 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 And finally, the number three gift. The number three gift is the gift of your pastor. Oh, by the way, we were asked in court. We were asked by the Supreme Court even. So why do you need to meet in person to have church? Why can't you do like everybody else and just watch it on a screen? I said, well, if that's the only option, that's what we'll use. But it's not the same. It's not the same. I said, now I had to think in terms like they think because they're not very biblically versed. I mean, I've got, I, I did a huge Bible study on this. And this became part of our briefs at the Supreme Court. This has helped what changed their mind as well from the first, you know, not ruling in our favor to finally ruling in our favor. And I got all kinds of verses that affirm that. But, but I had to think kind of like they think, right? And, and the reporters think and the, and the public thinks. So I said, okay, it's kind of like this. I said, what's the difference in taking your family camping or at the beach and build a bonfire and all sit around the fire enjoying that fellowship around the fire? What's the difference in that just saying, hey, we don't need to gather. Just stay home, and we'll all put a fire on our screen, and we'll watch it. <laughs> Big difference. <laughs> so they, they could kind of understand that. But when we go to the Bible, we read in the Bible that we are commanded <laughs> to gather together with the people of God. Where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Matthew 18, 20. I will give thee thanks in the great congregation. I will praise thee among much people, Psalm 35, 18. Exalt him also in the congregation of the people and praise him in the assembly, Psalm 107, 32. Let us go into the house of the Lord, Psalm 122, 1. Praise God in his sanctuary, Psalm 77, 13. To see thy power and thy glory, so as I have seen thee in the sanctuary, Psalm 63, 2. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped until I went into the sanctuary of God. Psalm 73, 2 and 17. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord. Psalm 134, 2. As Jesus' custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. Luke 4, 4 16. And they were all in one place, Acts 2 and 1. They assembled together themselves with the church, Acts eleven twenty six. 26. They gathered the church together, Acts 14, 27. When you come together in the church, 1 Corinthians eleven eighteen, 18, the whole church be come together into one place, 1 Corinthians 14, 23. Not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together, Hebrews 10, 25. Even the more so when you see the day of the Lord approaching, it goes on to say, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, Joel 2, 16. 1 Timothy 3, 15. I love this one. I've never noticed this verse in this context until preparing these briefs. It's pretty powerful. Here's what it says. If you put that on the screen, do it. 1 Timothy 3, 15. It's a very unique verse. You need to know this verse. 1 Timothy 3, 15. Know how Thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church. Those that say a building doesn't matter. Now, I'm not saying this building has some magical something in the walls or the pews. I'm not saying that. We don't venerate, you know, material objects. But there is something of significance. Once a building or a gathering place has been designated by the people of God as the place they will meet, to worship and praise and commune with their God, it makes that place sacred. It really, really does. Amen. When they gather, it becomes a sacred house of God. It's called the church. Malachi 3, 10, bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house. Psalm 149, 1, sing of the Lord a new song and his praise in the congregation in one place. And we, of course, two of the major points of this court case for gathering together in person, is the Bible says, if there's any sick among you, let them call upon the elders who will lay their hands on them, anoint them with oil and pray the prayer of faith, and they'll be 
healed. You can't lay your hands on someone through a screen. Now, we know God hears prayers and answers prayers without anybody being touched, but there are times he specifically says there needs to be a touch. We know also you can't baptize somebody through a screen. you got to do that in person, praise God, and it carried the day. Thank God. Let me give you one final fact here before I move on to the last gift. The one final fact, Gallup poll. This is really important. Gallup is not a Christian polling group, okay? It's a secular group. But the Gallup poll did a study. They said during COVID, every category of persons had declining mental health during COVID as a result of the COVID effects, except one group. And the one group that did not have declining health, this is their actual studies, actually had increased mental health during COVID. And guess who that was? Those who attended church weekly. I was glad when they said it to me. Let us go into the house of the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Let's thank God for the church. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. So you don't worry about the church. It's, don't worry about it surviving. It won't just survive. It will thrive. Hallelujah. So the number one greatest gift is the gift of the Holy Ghost. Number two is the gift of the church. And finally, number three, best gift of the ascension gifts is the gift of your pastor. Thank God for our pastor. Thank God for our pastor. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Ephesians 4, 8, that was our key text. Wherefore he saith, when he ascendeth up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Three verses later, verse 11, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Praise God. Of these, many call this the fivefold ministry, but of these, none are more important to you personally than your pastor, your pastor, your pastor. He may have given apostles and prophets to the church at large, teachers. Paul said, we've got thousands of instructors, but not many fathers. He gave you a pastor personally. Jeremiah 3.15, God said, I will give you pastors after my own heart. In other words, not of your choosing, but of my choosing, God said. And they will feed you with knowledge and understanding. Do you know why many people do not have understanding today? Because they are not standing under a pastor. It's just what the Bible says. Pastors will feed you with knowledge and understanding. Amen. The news media, they will feed you with knowledge and confusion. And the knowledge, we don't know if it's even factual, actual or not. Right? But pastors will feed you with knowledge and confusion understanding. Praise God. Hallelujah. The book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, calls the pastor the angel to the church. That's what Revelation calls a pastor. To each church, he said, I have given an angel. The pastor. Isn't that amazing? It's amazing. The pastor is the only one who is constantly, daily, individually in your life. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, teachers, they are periodic. But the pastor's permanent. The pastor's the only one that's called a shepherd. In fact, many times in Scripture, the word shepherd is used in place of the word pastor when the obvious meaning and application is the pastor. Amazing. Thank God for our pastor. In fact, 63 times the Hebrew word translated pastor is also translated shepherd. 63 times. From the Hebrew Aramaic Concordance, it says their role is, I quote, to feed a flock, to pasture, P-A-S-T-U-R-E, to tend, to guard, to care for, to rule. Thank God for the gift of a pastor. You can't really maintain the gift of a church without the gift of a pastor. Amen. The average pastor... This is according to Barna Research. The average pastor in America lasts five years. Five years. This church has only had three pastors over the last generation. And I think I think I got a text message early this morning. 
I think the founding pastor of this church was Clyde J. Haney, if I'm not mistaken. I believe it, I believe it was. And uh, it, it's amazing, the longevity of the, the pastors here. Amen. Dr. Archibald Hart, who was a personal friend, he oversaw the psychology department, taught over 50 years at Fuller Theological Seminary, the largest in the world, has authored more books on ministry and stress than any other author, between 30 and 40 books. And here's what he said. He said, the number one most stressful job in all the world, in all the world, is a pastor's wife. You know, when we pray for our pastor, we better think about the pastor's wife. Dr. Arch Hart said, that's number one most stressful. He said, number two is the pastor. And he said, number three is to be president of the United States of America. When I heard Dr. Hart say that, I thought, Bingo. I've been figuring out how I'm going to retire. My wife keeps saying, when do we retire? When do we retire? And I'm like, I don't know. I don't even know if I can spell that word. Life's speeding up, not slowing down. I don't know. And when I heard Hart say that, I thought, i got a retirement plan. I'm going to run for president because you only have to serve four little measly years, and you are set for life with a great pension and benefits and all that kind of stuff. You know. but, but the truth of the matter is, the pastors aren't a great stress. You know why? Again, because they're pastoring that church that the Antichrist hates. He's going to do all he can to destroy the pastor and the pastor's wife and family and so he can destroy the church. Pray for your pastor. George Barna, I'm with him in some periodic uh, Zoom conferences. Great, great researcher. George Barna said that during the pandemic from 2020 until now, over 20,000 pastors quit. Think about that. Well, I got news. Those were not pastors. They were called pastors. They called themselves pastors, but they weren't God-called pastors. Because the, war, the Word of God tells us a true pastor. It says there's a difference between a pastor and a hireling. It says the hireling will flee when danger approaches. If something's going to hurt that, they're going to run for their life. If, if David had been a hireling, that, that bear and that lion, they would have had their, their field day of, of, of feasting on the sheep that day. But no, David withstood them because he had the heart of a pastor. He was a true shepherd. And the Bible says the true shepherd will give his life for the sheep. The pastor God's given you, they're giving their life for this flock and the kingdom of God. We're grateful for that, pastor. We're grateful. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Let me draw this to conclusion today. There's a powerful reference. I don't have time to go into this, but let me just drop it in. You can do your own research later. It's in Genesis 46. Do you remember the story of Joseph when his family is coming to Egypt? And they're coming for food, and, of course, they provide food. And the whole story, he reveals himself to them and all of that. But then Joseph, because of his favor with Pharaoh, gets permission for his family to actually move to Egypt. And they gave them their own land. It was called Goshen. And that's where they lived. But Joseph told his brothers this. He said, you don't know the Egyptians. You don't know their customs. You don't know their culture. You don't know their ways. Let me give you some clues of what you need to do lest they become angry and fall upon you and destroy you. He said, one thing you need to know is the Egyptians hate shepherds. Do not tell them that you are shepherds. They hate shepherds. Now, why is that significant? Because in the Bible, the Old Testament is real stories, but the stories also have meaning for us today. The Bible calls it types and shadows of things which did not yet appear, but in our day, they do appear, all right? So for us, the type and shadow of Egypt represents the world, sin, evil. The type and shadow of Israel represents the church, the people of God, the godly, the righteous. Egypt hates shepherds. The world hates pastors. <laughs> it's the children of God. It's the sheep that love pastors. Goats don't like shepherds either. You can see these video clips. They're pretty prominent on YouTube of somebody, some guy trying to feed the sheep, but maybe he's got some goats mixed in there, and when he's got his back turned, what does the goat do? It comes running up and does what goats do. Boom! It hits that guy and sends him sprawl. You see those funny YouTubes? All right. The sheep never do that. Sheep never do that. If you go butt up against your pastor, 
You know what that's doing? That's revealing you, not him. It's revealing you're getting that old goat spirit on you. You need to get that off of you. Because in the end times, the Bible says, the Lord of lords and the King of kings, what's he going to do? He's going to separate what? The sheep from the goats. <laughs> from the goats. Get that goat out of you if it's in there. And the enemy wants you to be a goat, not a sheep. Amen. We need to love our shepherd. We need to thank God for our shepherd. We need to protect our shepherd. We need to provide for our shepherd. We need to, we need to pray for our shepherd. Amen. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Let's stand together today. Praise God. Hallelujah. In fact, if I can do this, Pastor, did you want to give this altar pill? You want me to give this? Or... All right. What I'd like to do, I'll turn it to you in a moment. I'd like everybody in the building. Get, I'm a guest too, and I'm already up here, okay? So every, I would like you all to join us down front. Now, I know you all can't fit, but let's see how many can fit, all right? And we'll close it that way. Just get, if you're the first to come, get as close as you can. Get your toes right up there against that altar so we can just get as many people in there as we can. And I want to make a last comment and a prayer, and I'm going to turn it to your pastor to close out the way he wants. Hey, if you just come as close, this is so wonderful. You folks are just, wow, I'm impressed. Look at this audience. You are just responding. God bless you. God bless, what a great church. God bless you. God bless you. That's it. Just come as close as you can. We'll pack as many in as we can. Praise God. You don't have to be a member here. Just, we can just all join and participate here. Thank you. Just keep coming. They're still coming. That's beautiful. Wow, this is beautiful. I got to take your picture. You're so beautiful. usually do that. In fact, I don't know that I've ever done that, but, but I did it today. This is just such an awesome group. I, I just love the response. It's amazing. There's nobody left out there. It's like, wow, look at you. You're great. Wow. Wow. So let me close with this. These three greatest gifts, the Holy Ghost, the church, the pastor. The Holy Ghost is essential. You know, all during COVID, when we got involved in that fight, I, I preached a message early on the church is essential because they were you know they're talking about what's essential what's not essential and obviously they're thinking the church is not essential they're marginalizing us the rest of that whole year every message that i preached had the word essential in it the title of every message this is essential that one of them was the holy ghost is essential well it really is true the holy ghost is essential the church is essential your pastor is essential but let me tell you something our key text was Jesus ascending, giving gifts, right? The three best ascension gifts. And the angel said, the same Jesus you saw go away in clouds is going to come back, right, in clouds. And he's going to catch you up. We call that rapture. That's not word really not in the Bible, but it means to be caught up to meet him in the air. And that is in the Bible. So we're all watching and waiting for that. That's the next big event for us. We don't need one more prophecy to be fulfilled Nothing's preventing that happening. It can happen any time. I hope it happens today. I don't even care if I make it home. God, just take me to my real home. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Right? I mean, that's what we're waiting and watching for. But let me tell you something. I want to be very kind, but I, I want to be very clear. I can't mince words here. Your future ascension, if you go, if you're one of the ones he catches up, it's going to depend on three things. Number one, the Holy Ghost in you. Number two, the church that surrounds you. And number three, your pastor that he's placed over you. If you don't have the Holy Ghost in you, and if you don't have your church around you, and if you don't have your pastor over you, you're not ascending. So these are the three primary best gifts. Hallelujah. If you're here today and you don't have the Holy Ghost in you, it's as simple as saying, Lord, I want it. And the only prerequisite for you to receive his Holy Spirit is to repent of your sins. Be sorry for the wrongs and the evils. We've all done them. Ask him to forgive every wrong thought. Ask him to forgive every wrong word. 
Ask him to forgive every wrong action that we've done, and he will forgive you. It's that simple. It's that easy. The heavy lifting was on his part. He did that on Calvary. You don't have to do the heavy lifting. Just ask him, forgive me, Lord. Every wrong thought, every wrong word, every wrong action, he will forgive you. And then ask him into your heart. Ask his spirit to fill you. To over- he will do that. I personally receive the Holy Ghost before I was baptized. So, yes, I do know you can receive the gift of the Holy Ghost even before You're baptized. I was baptized about two weeks after I received the gift of the Holy Ghost. If you repent and you are baptized in the name of Jesus Christ in water for the remission of your sins, you are then promised the gift of the Holy Ghost. It is a promise of yours because the Scripture says you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. But I'm going to pray over you, and then your pastor is going to come. But I want to pray over you. I want to pray if you've not received the gift of the Holy Ghost, that you will receive that gift. If you have received the gift of the Holy Ghost, that you will stir up that gift of the Holy Ghost within you. Amen. I'm going to pray over you that you will make this your church. You will be surrounded. You won't be on the fringes of your... To be surrounded, you can't be on the outside, right? you got to be in the middle of it to be surrounded. That you'll be surrounded by your church. You'll just get right in the middle of your church and activity and family and fellowship and relationship. And then thirdly, that you'll be under the pastor that God has placed over you to feed you with knowledge and understanding. Lord God, I pray for everyone standing here, every man, woman, boy, and girl. We pray a prayer of repentance, Lord. We ask you to forgive us for every wrong thought, every wrong word, every wrong action. And I pray, God, you would fill every single one with the gift of the Holy Ghost. Those that have received this gift before, reactivate it. Stir up that gift, I pray, God, that is within us. Hallelujah. I pray, God, for this church, Lord, this church that is a sanctuary. It's a safe place. It's the safest place on earth. When I'm hurting, I'm going to run to church. When I'm sick, I'm going to run to church. When I'm being threatened, I'm going to run to church. It's the sanctuary, God, the safe space on earth. Hallelujah. When my marriage is in trouble, I'm going to run to church. When my job is jeopardized, I'm going to run to church, God. This is the place I'm going to be. I'm glad when they say, let's go to church. And God, I thank you for the pastor that you've given this church and this flock, that you've placed over them, God, who feeds them with knowledge and with understanding. Let us value these gifts more than any other. The gift of the Holy Ghost, the gift of the church, the gift of the pastor. Let us know these are the most valuable gifts we possess. Indeed, what does it gain a man if he gains the whole world but loses his own soul? There's no profit in that, God. There's profit in you. The best gifts come from you. The best gifts come from heaven and from above. We thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Children of God, pray. Pray until you're praying in the Holy Ghost. Pray until the Holy Ghost is praying through you and flowing through you and moving through you like a river, praise God. Rivers of living water. Thank you, Jesus. 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 Thank you, you, Lord. Amen. Pray with somebody nearby you. You're not alone. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. We're a body. We're a family. We're not alone. Praise God.